I think I want to start by uh, telling you about an a, um, exchange I saw last night. They had uh, Stephanie Flanders interviewing Martin Wolf about the Eurozone and the EU. Was anybody there last night? No? <clears throat> it was interesting. Um, one of the things that I've been saying recently is that the economic stability that seems to be in the system now, certainly in the UK and, and arguably in Europe, it's, it's not brilliant performance, but it's stable, it gives government a little bit more flexibility in terms of trying to move the agenda forward in terms of taking a more strategic approach to uh, economic planning and the like. Although uh, I think the consensus in the room last night was that, whereas that may be true in the UK, uh, in the uh, European, in the Eurozone, uh, you really need to be on the edge of a catastrophe before the minds of the individual policymakers are focused enough to actually achieve something. So contentious is the environment in which they're trying to push through these sorts of policies. So I don't know whether uh, um, it's a good thing or a bad thing that the Eurozone is actually at a, what appears to be a, a period of stability. If we look at the... Uh, can you read this okay, I hope? Okay, uh, so I want to say just a couple words about where the Eurozone economy, or sorry, where the European economy is in general. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, what we have here is uh, purchasing manager indices. And over on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the really tall one. That's Ireland, which is up at around 60. The middle number is 50. Anything above uh, these uh, 50 usually means expansion. Anything above 55 is very strong expansion. So if you look across uh, the spectrum, you can see that uh, sort of a mixed performance. Uh, the U.S. is actually quite strong. The U.K. is also very strong. Spain is showing uh, good growth. I think Spain and Ireland. Of course, they're coming off low bases and all the rest. Get, more importantly, Germany is looking expansive again. I can tell you that uh, I think uh, one of the reasons that sentiments improved just recently is that uh, it was announced last week that uh, Germany and France did not go in recession. Uh, so that actually, I think, gave a, a boost to confidence. We move along. The Eurozone is sort of uh, slightly above. Um, China is an interesting story because I think a lot of uh, uh, German export performance is linked to the Chinese economy. And China has said that it's going to do a bit of uh, work to stimulate uh, the economy. Hence, that might be good news uh, for the Eurozone in general and EU in general. So what else do we have here? Italy is uh, still struggling. And I thought the interesting thing, and I wasn't sure whether to say this or not, is that uh, <coughs> Russia, from a purchasing manager agency's point of view, seems to be outperforming France at the moment. <coughs> so I don't understand that. But uh, the, I'd say the only caveat on this is even though it looks fairly favorable, um, or at least uh, slightly better than stable, the forward-looking, um, what are they, order books uh, within this type of survey would suggest that things are a little bit flat. So it's not quite as rosy. Well, it doesn't look brilliantly rosy, but it's not quite as rosy as it might otherwise appear. Now these are, uh, what I've done here is I've taken the Eurostat economic sentiment indicator, which is uh, indigenous to each country's uh, uh, feeling about how the economy is doing. And the blue is what it, how it's changed within the last year. And as you move uh, across the spectrum, it goes from six, six months ago to three months ago to over the last month, change in, in perception. So pretty much across the board, with the exception of the UK, uh, the sentiment has improved quite considerably over the last year. Then we went through a period in the middle of the year, and I think this is when the uh, German economic performance figures were a bit weak, which I think brought down the whole uh, sentiment outlook for the entire Eurozone. Uh, but then you can see that over the last couple of months, and particularly the last month, sentiment has ticked up. And I think a lot of this has to do with uh, some stronger data, marginally stronger data that's just now starting to come through. So I think that uh, the good news here is that uh, I think going forward, we have what appears to be a uh, generally a slightly more stable environment. The other thing to say about it is that the sentiment indicator is, for some reason, it's been a very good indicator of GDP performance in uh, Europe as a whole. So the fact that we've just ticked up a lot of these zones, in Germany in particular, uh, and even in France, uh, would suggest that at least we're going to stay positive over the next uh, quarter or so. Now I want to pull out a couple of slides, or show you a couple of slides from um, the recent survey that we just published, which is the Global Investment Sentiment Survey. We do this once a year. This year it included about 630 investors worldwide. 
just to ask them simple questions about whether they're expansive, whether they're contracting, uh, what sort of um, IRRs they're trying to achieve, or what sort of yields. And, things. and I've taken just a few top level slides. It's a lot more to the study than what I'm going to show you, but I just want to set the stage for, for the discussion that's going to happen today. Now, the first thing that I think is quite extraordinary, and I think this goes back to the, the original story of the so called international search for yield being one of the main drivers of the market, is that pretty much wherever you go in the world, all the blue lines would suggest that everybody is looking to expand their portfolios into property. So I think there's an asset, asset allocation <coughs> shift going on worldwide, which is pumping a lot more into um, property. The yellows are the, oh, are the only places in the world where we could find where people have actually said they're looking to reduce uh, the size of their portfolios. Interestingly, I thought that the largest one, and it's not very big, was the UK. And the only thing I could think there is that there's some talk that the UK is, certain sections of the UK are pretty fully priced. Hence, I think there's some people that are reducing their port so portfolios with the aim of gearing up to go through another period of expansion. So we'll see what the survey says next year when we, when we get to that. The other thing was risk appetite. Uh, now, according to this, everything above the line, the global average, 59% of the sample said we're going to expand our risk profile. I think that's up by about 5 or 6% on last year. And if you break down the world in terms of who wants to take the additional risk, uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, Western Europe, and the U.S. are on the upside of, of that particular margin. So these are people that are saying, yeah, we want to move up the risk curve. But what's interesting, though, is since the whole risk profile has shifted up a year, uh, you know, last year I think a lot of people took on risk. Now they're saying that after having taken on all this additional risk over the last year, now we're going to take on a bit more, which I think is, uh, again, being driven by this international search for yield. UK is at the bottom of the list here. Don't know what that means. Maybe the art panelists can tell us. <laughs> now this one's sort of an interesting one, um, and I'm not sure if you can see this too well. Basically this is the leveraged IRR targets of the investor base or the survey that we did. And what I've done is I've started on the left and the bottom, those people targeting 0 to 5 percent IRR. As you can see, there's almost nobody. And then 6 to 10, you know, it starts to take up 11 to 15 percent, 16 to 20 percent, and 21 plus percent. Now the dotted line is what the global survey sort of profile was. So you can see that most people were targeting somewhere that looks like around 8 or 9% in terms of the way the charts are smoothed out. And you can see that the UK in blue is a similar profile, uh, as is the Pacific, so uh, New Zealand, Australia. What I think is really quite striking, and also I think is worthy of comment for the panelists later today, is that the Asia response uh, showed uh, that they were targeting returns that are significantly above the global average, as was the US. Now, I, I thought maybe this has something to do with risk appetite, but I think it has a little bit more to do with the availability of debt. I know certainly in the U.S., I think the figure for uh, debt availability, about 80, 90 percent of the sample almost said that, yes, they're going to use debt at a much higher level than they have in the past in order to achieve the returns they want to return. Interestingly, in Asia, they didn't seem to suggest that uh, they were going to use as much debt. Now, either this is an anomaly within the survey, or maybe there's something to, uh, for the panelists to address uh, uh, when they step up. Now, one thing's clear, though, is that uh, the EMEA, according to the latest transaction figures, continues to attract far more investment, cross-border investment, I should say, than any other region. It's up 51% uh, um, cross-border, let's see, investment in 2014. Was, 50, was up 51% compared to 11% in the Americas and 12% in the Asia Pacific. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's basically it's, it's worldwide and when we were going through the survey, pretty much all of the different regions had high allocation, particularly to, well, if we look at the individual cities, London came up as number one. It gets a bit tiresome, you know, being standing in the middle of London and saying, you know, London's number one. <laughs> That's the way it is. But it's followed also, which I think is very interesting, this year by all the Asian city, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Tokyo, and then New York is down around seventh or eighth, and Paris is a little bit further down the scale than that. So uh, 
certainly uh, London's on the target, but if you look more generally at country targets, you can see that the UK also comes out again very high, but followed by Germany, France, and Spain. So the significant interest in, um, in Europe, that seems to continue to play out. And I think you ask yourself, well, why, I was asked this the other day, why uh, would people be targeting Europe when the economic performance uh, doesn't really appear to be so strong? And I think the general feeling is, is that everybody anticipates that there's going to be a relatively strong recovery sometime <coughs> soon. Now this recovery scheme just keep, you know, the time frame of the recovery seems to keep slipping, I guess you might say, but I, I still think that the general uh, consensus is, is that they expect that. Certainly, you know, the UK, the US, and Lent, and typically it's not too long before Europe will follow in the normal cycle of things. So I think that's probably what's driving a lot of the interest. But again, we'll have the panelists who will be happy to speak to that. If we look at the uh, latest yield profile across uh, Europe, the London West End is uh, still at around 3.75, and all <coughs> indications are that it's reasonably stable. Um, London City has uh, just come down on the back of a couple of big deals. I think we had some fellow in the room that bought the Gurk in here just uh, the other day. That may have pushed things down a bit further. <laughs> so we're calling it uh, five and a quarter percent, uh, sorry, four and a quarter percent. Uh, again, these stack up against the other sort of haven cities like Paris and Munich. They're uh, around four. And I think what we're probably going to see over the course of the next year as the weight of money continues to figure in is that the yields in some of the, uh, not really secondary cities, but where yield compression hasn't really come through yet, I think we'll probably start to see substantial yield compression uh, coming through in some of the other markets now. Uh, one thing is for sure, you know, we, we'll talk a lot about the Asian capital a little bit. And it's a quite considerable force in the market. But let's not forget that uh, you know, uh, the American investors are definitely here. And these are just a list of some of the people that are active in the type and the amount of money they have allocated for real estate. If you look at the chart, um, the yellow shows the total amount of aggregate capital that was raised over the course of 2014 so far. And you can see that it far exceeds everything that we've done in every year uh, since 2009. So the sheer weight of money uh, seems to continue to accumulate. And I think that's what's going to continue to drive the, uh, this particular investment cycle, as it were. I think the cycle's probably got um, a lot of life in left in it. The, uh, um, Tony Arell, my CEO, keep uh, discussing this on a daily basis. He says, no, 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 Walter, we got a lot of more weight coming through, more more money coming through. And, you know, I have to trust him because he sits with a lot of these uh, capital raisers on a regular basis. Uh, but I think that uh, I think the two things that, that are really driving the market are, wonder this extraordinarily low uh, interest rate environment, as long as interest rates stay as low as they are, I think there's quite a lot of life that will come into the market just by virtue of uh, the fact there's no other place to place money uh, and that there's probably an upside to the world economy over the course of the next five years. Uh, the other one is just the sheer weight of money, which uh, I don't want to uh, belabor. So look, this is our, uh, this is the advertising bit. Um, our, we have a big capital markets team and this is where pretty much we collect most of the information that uh, we put across to, uh, to uh, all our clients. Uh, we're well represented in Asia, and uh, we've got Richard Dival here today who's meant to be coordinating all this activity uh, worldwide. He'll be on the board, so he'll be happy to answer those sorts of questions. But look, I'll stop there.